Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. This is certainly a, an important subject, something that we've talked about before. Some of you have been here before. Um, Mr. Cooper, I haven't heard much from you, so I wanted to start with you today and, and ask you a question. First of all, full disclosure, I represent the entire coast of Georgia, over 100 miles of coastline. Therefore, marine engines are extremely important to us, and the impact that some of these fuels have on the negative impact that some of them can have on marine um, engines are, are certainly a, a, of interest and, and certainly of concern. Biobutanol, as I understand it, it has some um, properties that more closely align with gasoline than ethanol does. And, it has much less, I'm sure, much less of a negative impact on, on engines. And in fact, the National Marine Manufacturers Association and the American Boat and Yacht Council did a five-year study with the Department of Energy and, and found out, that the studied the properties of isobutanol fuels on engines. And, and that was very helpful for all of us. Um, just wanted to ask you, if biobutanol were widely available in the market, how would it fit into the current supply? How would, how would we be able to incorporate it? Well, thank you for the question. And, and I guess the, the first thing I would say is, is, you know, first of all, E10, 10% ethanol blends are approved and, and warranted for, for all off-road engines today, including uh, outboard marine engines and, and motorcycles. Um, so the, the fuel that is most common in the marketplace today is, is absolutely fine for use in, in outboard engines and, and, and marine applications. Uh, in terms of, of biobutanol, you know, certainly we do see some, some promise there. We have some member companies who are uh, either producing or, or very interested in producing biobutanol uh, along with, with ethanol. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think there are uh, other, other molecules, other, other applications, other biofuels that, uh, uh, that, that at higher blend levels could be uh, suitable for today's... Are there any obstacles for the companies that want to market this? Or are they having any barriers they're having to overcome? It's primarily cost today. Is that um, it's, right? it, I mean, you can't... Uh, biobutanol just can't compete with, with ethanol and other, other components um, in terms of, of production cost. How much of a difference are we talking about? I, I'd have to get back to you on that, Mr. But it is significant enough to uh, where... It, it's, it's significant enough that we're not seeing widespread adoption of biobutanol today. Okay. Mr. Um, Thompson, I'll go to you. Um, as I understand it, 95 octane is, is the correct octane level. In fact, you mentioned in your testimony that the ideal level was, was 95 for maximizing the output of vehicles. How, how did you arrive at that? How did you arrive at the 95 octane being the, the maximum level? Thank you for the question. Um, you know, this is a conclusion we reached with working with several stakeholders, but with really with the U.S. car and others, uh, where we got technical expertise from the, uh, from the refiners and, and from the autos. And frankly, they, they worked for almost two years exploring a lot of things and looking at, at the whole system cost. If you were looking to get a three to four improvement, efficiency improvement out of the autos, uh, what would be the, the cheapest way for consumers to get there? either all the improvements from the auto side or all the improvements coming from fuel. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is documented in my testimony before this committee in April, but we did a, simply a cost analysis. And what we found was that the cheapest way to get that three to 4% uh, efficiency improvement came from 95 RON. The other part of this was one of the big factors was making sure whatever we selected according to the autos, and rightfully so, the fuel had to be available on day one, and it had to be available nationwide. Anything other than 95 RON is not available nationwide. California and nine other states, you know, prohibit higher uh, levels of octane. Or in so you couldn't go to 97 in California? Uh, under their predictive model, uh, our conclusion was no. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, one other question, just to follow up. Um, does your organization have any specific numbers on how gas mileage would improve for customers across the U.S.? Well, again, a couple of things. One, it would, it would be a 3 uh, to 4% improvement, efficiency improvement. That translates into gas miles. Uh, it's, and the other thing, it's for those who, it's equivalent to putting 720,000 electric vehicles on the road year after year after year. So there's a substantial improvement efficiency improvement by doing this. I, I suspect that would, that would be hard to sell to a consumer who just concentrates on price. Um, 
I, I would hope uh, I would hope we would have a, a, a good story to tell. This is uh, would be a high efficiency fuel that helps make their uh, their cars more efficient. It keeps optionality. It allows them to choose an uh, internal combustion engine that's more efficient uh, over, say, an uh, electrified vehicle they may not want. I mean, I, I think the consumer, when they fully understand the offering, will be supportive. Great. My time has ended, and I yield. Gentleman yields back. Uh, waving on to the committee.